Legally, I've been using medical marijuana since July of this year. From 2001 to now, I've been treating myself um, without a license. And of course, you know, that was irrelevant to me because I wouldn't be sitting here today if I didn't even have my cannabis, if I did not have my cannabis in me, I wouldn't be sitting here. I've been suffering from the onset of MS since 2001. Um, I'm partially disabled on my right side. My driving symptoms are severe weakness, sensory loss, um, gait difficulties, and severe pain. I have what's called classic multiple sclerosis, which means I've got lesions on my spinal cord and brain. Um, my disease progressively gets worse. There is no cure. Um, despite the medical industry's best efforts, they have come up with no cure, no, they've just come up with no treatments, no adequate treatments for multiple sclerosis. Um, what makes MS unique is there are only about 475,000 in the U.S. with MS. There are no two people on the planet with MS who share the same course. Now, there's three unknowns about MS. They don't know how you get it, where it comes from, and there's no cure. Now, this is where my willingness to deviate from the medical industry is very straightforward. If you don't know anything about it, how can I trust what you're telling me is going to help? There's a political side, too. There's insurance involved. There's money involved. Okay, I'm, I'm very difficult with my neurologist. And I don't mean to get off topic. I just, I refuse medications. I refuse tests. You've already made it clear to me. You don't know anything about the disease, so what are we doing? You know, you've already told me no two people share the same course. You've told me I'm African American. The disease progression is a lot worse. I'm on my own. It's critical that medical marijuana stays in place, but with some sort of you know, regulation. The benefits that I get from it are fascinating. I've refused all medical treatment, folks. I've had the disease for eight and a half years. I still mountain bike. I still work out. I still run my dog. Um, I get to live a normal life. My speech is still fluent. And I've got lesions sitting in my brain that should have damaged my speech. And the one thing I laugh at the most, whatever it is you're doing, Ray, keep doing it. If I could get that, those two neurologists to stand right here and say that, that would lend a lot of credibility because they have no idea what I'm doing. They know that every time they see me, I'm doing good. So at the end of the day, this is why I'm doing good. I relapsed three times. In the last seven years, I did not even know it. I put 1,400 miles on my mountain bike last summer in the middle of relapsing. I had no clue because in order for me to function, I would get off work. I was using it recreationally. It motivated me to work out. It motivated me to jump on my mountain bike. I kept relapsing. My MS was getting worse. And when I relapsed bad enough to where I couldn't walk, they found it amazing that I have not been getting treated. Um, I do have asthma. Um, I was always a skeptic of asthma and marijuana. I'm no longer a skeptic. I haven't used my inhaler in four weeks. Um, and that's nice because anytime I do any strenuous activities, um, I don't need it. The marijuana, medical marijuana takes care of itself. And there are no side effects. And that's the best part. You know, as part of my treatment, you know, there are a number of ways I can consume my medical marijuana, and I, from time to time, like to use edibles. Well, you know, they contain dairy products, they go bad, and some dispensaries, you know, although their intent is good, there's nobody really overseeing that, and there are cases of mold. That's my health. You know, it's as simple as me having an allergic reaction. Um, I think there should be some sort of oversight regarding the product that's out there. Um, none of those guys are experts. They don't know anything about my particular disease. I know a particular strain I need. Um, you have so many different names. You have a lot of misinformation. I think it needs to be a little more structured. The pharmaceutical industry is waiting for this to just 
fall apart because then they don't have to compete with us. They don't have to contest with us. Um, I have a problem with the demographics. 88% that are registered, and this is unbelievable, are there under quote unquote pain. You have 2% glaucoma, 2% like MS, I think 2.5% HIV, um, you know, hepatitis. And when I'm sitting next to a 24, 25 year old in a dispensary waiting room, and he's talking to his buddy about how he cheated to get his license, and then he leans over and looks at me and says, hey, I know a doctor who can hook you up. You know what I do? Because I have this, you know, unusual thought process and how I interpret information. I just stood up and told him I didn't need any help. And, but it disgusts you. That's why, you know, Governor Romer's having these issues. You know, this isn't a grassroots movement, you guys. You're making fools of yourself. Now look at it. These dispensaries are being robbed. I mean, it's crazy. Over my medicine. Yeah? These guys are going in and taking my medicine. Yeah. I go into some dispensaries, and this is fascinating. They don't provide any service. They don't have a fake chair. They don't have a fake this. They're just selling pot. You ask the lady, well, what strain is this? She has no clue. Do you smoke? Are you a user? No. Oh, that begs a question. Are, do you even have a license to be in possession? So, you know, again, it's, it's out of control. I got this diagnosis in March of this year. I can no longer work. I'll be living off of social security disability. The state has allowed me to treat my disease, but I can't, you know, fund my disease. I can't pay for it. You know, cannabis is very expensive. That's out of pocket. But if I decided I wanted to take Vicodin, which is very accessible for me because of my disease, that's, I can get that just like that. Uh, my insurance covers it. So, you know, it would only be fitting if the state allows me to treat my disease with this medication. Then there should be an entity that also helps for those who need to treat their disease financially. I've been given birthday courtesies as a result of my professional caregiver. Um, I'm offered samples. Um, I have a place where I can go and medicate, and that's important for me um, because of my MS. Um, it's, it's, it's almost as if it's a social gathering. You know, you associate with people that are like-minded like you, um, outstanding service. In addition to that, you know, it's, it's kind of odd to get a phone call from your caregiver saying, hey, Ray, I've got a new sample for you. I want to give you a shot and see if, what you think of it. I mean, you tell you don't even have your own doctors calling you for that. Um, so, you know, again, it speaks volumes. There's, there, there has to be a deep-rooted relationship in order for this to work because then you get the full magnitude of why something like this has the power to debunk the stigma and, and change the status quo. When you're talking about health insurance and getting nurses involved and insurance companies involved, that's things that we like to hear. If there are going to be dispensaries, got to have an oversight. And uh, secondly, there's got to be a program created for people who are indigent, who cannot afford it. We're like any other industry. And I mean, honestly, that's my purpose for coming here. Other than the obvious benefits of it is, you know, the industry needs to have oversight and there has to be thought into those who can't afford it. I don't want to think that we're all sick in the state of Colorado and the tremendous number of dispensaries going up begs the question. Um, I see profit margins, I think there shouldn't be a profit margin. Profit shouldn't be a consideration for what um, dispensaries provide. It shouldn't be about the almighty dollar. 